Chapter 5 It is odd enough that when Ambrose's notebook was submitted, as has been stated, in no very respectful spirit to the judgment of an eminent literary authority, the little episode of Elphine and the Magic Ship, as he called it, was one of the points most emphasized in the great man's very courteous letter. This story in particular, he advises, should be written up for all it is worth. Is the legend really an old one? Would it be possible to get up a discussion as to its sources? Anyhow, it should be expanded, and I know a man who could do some capital colored plates to illustrate it. This emphasis is odd, because, as it happens, Ambrose returns to the tale himself, and illustrates it in his own fashion, which is a different one from that proposed by the authority. He does not continue the love story, if there is a love story, of Sylvia and himself. A line is drawn across the page of manuscript, and the following dissertation takes the place of the colored plates. Many explanations have been given of this curious mythos of Elphine and the Coracle of the Blessed. It is not necessary to do more than mention Professor Evans's very ingenious and original conjecture that Elphine was a solar deity, that the saints are really dawn goddesses, and that the treasure is evidently the sun, returning in splendor after the rigors of winter, or perhaps after the darkness of night. A later scientific authority has demonstrated, with immense learning, that Elphine is most certainly a culture god. The treasure may be some sacred object or fetish deemed essential to the success of the crops, but is more probably the seed itself, symbolizing vitality, and the constancy of the reproductive forces of nature. This demonstration also may be mentioned and passed by, since folly is wearisome, even though it be learned. In the old Welsh manuscript at the Wern, which my father had catalogued, from the color of its very ancient binding, as the Red Book of Thancarfan, neither the sun nor the crops are assigned these important functions in the genesis of the myth. Instead of these matters, there is a curious dialogue poem in which St. Cadoc, surnamed the Wise, is supposed to answer the question of a disciple. There are in all a hundred and fifty verses, but those which relate to the coracle and the divine treasure are as follows. Venerable Cadoc, illustrious in the company of the saints, inform me, I entreat you, concerning the ship of the blessed. Whence did it sail? From what far regions? Excellent disciple, you ask of a great matter. Be instructed, then, concerning the holy vessel. It sailed from a far region, from the exceeding brightness. It sailed from the great deeps, from the bottomless abysses, where the light of this world is as midnight darkness. It proceeded from the region which is named God. Its flight was swift as the lightning, the billows boiled beneath it. Its radiance was terrible as gold on the brow of an emperor. Its saints sang Alleluia, a song that is triumphant. Its form no man could discern. Its hues were ever-changing. All the colors of the world were shining on that vessel. If the jewels of the mass chalice were living, to these its hues were comparable. This was the ship that conveyed the great treasure, the principal divine mystery, a relic of paradise. By a single leaf, the nature of the tree may be judged. If the casket be difficult to describe, how much more the jewel! The names of the treasure are infinite in number. It is reflected in the eye. It is hidden in the flower. All men seek for it in all regions of the world. Many have gone astray, descending to the depths of hell. Hence it is that the instructed call this treasure heaven. Rightly indeed, Ambrose proceeds, is the treasure of the coracle given this high and final title. I need not say, of course, that the verses from the Red Book of Thancarvan have been interpreted in various senses by the few who have seen them. My father had the manuscript transcribed and twenty-five copies of the book printed.
Some of these he sent to his correspondents, but I believe that, on the whole, he was disappointed with the letters he received. The most enthusiastic comment came from a German scholar, the successor of Zeus, who was deeply interested, but purely in the philological forms of the text. Of the home authorities, one interprets the treasure as the Agam character, or, in a wide sense, the art of literature. Another says that, in his opinion, the discovery of the use of metals is hinted at. And a third writes, It is clearly one of the many missionary legends, which occupy so large a place in Celtic literature generally. It has great affinities with the Graal legend, which was, no doubt, originally a picturesque account of the Christianization of Britain. And so forth and so forth. But how wonderful these verses are! not in their expression, which seems to me very much below the standard of the best Welsh poetry, but in their apprehension of a profound mystery. Of course, in comparing them with the mythos in its prose form, which is more generally known, it must be remembered that the Isle of Britain in Celtum has much the same significance and symbolism as Israel bears in Jewry. The material island has been transmuted and glorified, unconsciously perhaps, in some cases, till it and its mountains and rivers, its hills and havens and cities, are as sacred and as mystic in their sense as Sim and Sean and Jordan are in another terminology. So the statement in one of the Cadvalader poems that Saxons shall be eradicated and bards shall flourish could be equated by the Philistines shall perish and the sons of Judah shall rejoice. This general consideration is necessary to the understanding of the particular legend, or rather myth, of Elphine, the coracle and the treasure. It is rightly, indeed, called heaven, for it is heaven manifested, a relic of paradise, a flower from the old garden. How truly astonishing it is to meditate on this great mystery! or rather on this sovereign and especial revelation and manifestation of the mysteries. The real truth is so infinitely greater than the truth as it is imagined to exist by the followers of the supreme vanity called occult science. These people, as I have noted elsewhere, are in reality caught in the folds of the thick veil of multitudinous illusions. But I am thinking now of their conception of what the truth is. They think of it, as one may think, and rightly, of the higher mathematics, Chinese or astronomy, as an abstruse and difficult study, success in which is to be attained by much intellectual effort, by the acquisition of many formulae, the receipt of much careful and expert instruction. To this vast error they add another. They believe that the lore they desire has been kept secret by certain bodies in certain hidden sanctuaries, in the same fashion by similar machinery and methods as were used by the great craft guilds of the Middle Ages to preserve their trade secrets. Not in such wise is the treasure of the coracle to be attained. How marvelous, to those who understand, is the thought of this great gift not enclosed in the custody of any secret body, but lying open to the whole world, one may almost say, touched and tasted, seen and handled by every man, the theme of constant conversation, of books, of pictures. No country or region is devoid of its presence. It is the subject of songs both good and bad. It has been built in stone and marble. It haunts the closes of music. And yet, so great is the mystery, not one in a thousand, even of those who have treated it worthily, have the remotest thought of what it truly is. It is everywhere known and everywhere unknown, by everyone praised, by everyone despised. Those who would robe it in most splendid garments, strip it naked. Those who believe that they are the most devout of all worshippers, scream hideous blasphemies. These things are of the nature of paradox, but the wisdom is a paradox in the earthly language, and its gifts are received incongruously, if one may say so.
It may well be that a man has learnt the mystery of the stars by speaking a single word, if Dante knew anything of this matter. So great is the mystery, yet we can imagine that a black pygmy or some such savage might think of a cathedral as solid when he first saw it. He might perhaps think its height very wonderful, its pinnacles and spires strange fantastic rocks. The windows would appear masses of glittering crystals, disposed in curious tracings and patterns. The organ and the choir might well be deemed an odd effect made by the wind blowing through such an intricate forest of jagged stones. The gargoyles and statues would pass very well for freaks of nature. There are just such queer things in sticks and stones and vegetables in every museum. But he would have no notion of the existence of the inside of the cathedral, the pillars and the arches, the glory of the painted glass, the depths of the crypt, the splendors of the vaulting, the veil of the rood, the laver of regeneration, the burning torches, the fuming incense, the singing priests, the altar, and the sacrifice. How can he so much as dream of these things, gazing, as he thinks, on an odd stone mountain? All the whole world gazes at the cathedral. Few, indeed, have any notion that it is a cathedral, that it has a within as well as a without, and that it is the shrine of a great mystery. It is set on the mountain of the world and cannot be hid. By how few can it be discerned? Nay, some even have entered and have found nothing but mumbo-jumbo magic being done in the sanctuary, their eyes being dim and bleary. What would a thirsty costermonger on a bank holiday make of a magnum of Lafitte, the juice of a great year? He would know that it was wet. His thirst would be satisfied after a sort but he would spit very likely and pull a wry face and call for a pot of the foulest ale to take the taste away how many myriads of children have looked at and handled and trodden and gathered and flung away how many myriads of daisies since there have been children and daisies on the earth how many of these children have understood the nature and being of a daisy according to the laws of botanical science so great is the mystery. Everywhere is the treasure present. Everywhere it is visible. Scarcely at all is it known. And for its high elect servants, it holds most intolerable, unconjectured mysteries and sacraments. And so they who know most know also how poor and slight their comprehension is. They who serve the flame and they alone understand how unsearchable are its inmost depths. Here Ambrose's disquisition ends, and after several blank pages in the book, there is a strange matter concerning a valley at night. It would seem that the old man being busy with his odd tasks, the two cousins had wandered forth, had crossed the marshy land, and entered a hidden valley on a warm still night, when the roses of the sunset seemed to linger in the western sky, and the air was so hushed that not a leaf stirred on the poplar or on the aspen tree. They sat in the valley by a little rippling stream, breathing the solemn air of the approaching night, made aromatic by the growth of sweet-scented ferns, by the subtle odor of the meadow-sweet, and very slowly the darkness gathered about the boughs of the twisted oak, about the fairy drooping of the ash, about the feathery spray of the birch, the olive-colored willow leaves became gray as they dripped down to the little torrent that poured beneath them. The glimmer vanished from the beach, and the old yew in the middle of the break darkened into a black mound, funereal, melancholy. But the thorn tree of the narrow crooked stem and the spreading growth of leaves stood out clear against the skyline, on the summit of the wall of turf that shut in that hidden valley. The air was growing dimmer, but the faintest rosy light now hung like a veil above the dark ridge of the mountain. But on this night the light never faded, for now the great full moon swam upward from the thin drifts of cloud and glowed over the hill. At first there was a great circle of dull red, glorious but without radiance, and as it mounted higher 
it shone with rich splendor, mingling with the last afterglow and enchanting the earth utterly. Before their eyes the world was changed, and all the forms of things were imbued with a new and magical significance. This was now no valley in Gwent, no petty glen among the hills and woods that lay near the Wern. Into some strange country it had been instantly transmuted in the of God. Nay, it was not wholly new, for in dreams they had visited it, and in desires and in ineffable longings that could not be uttered, in waking visions some glamorous shadow of it had transiently appeared. There were depths and heights, dark shadows and isles of light, that each of them had seen with half-closed eyes when they were children, and that great tree that spread out its boughs like a fan on the summit of the hill had its double in old memories. A little while ago, but a few moments since, there had been a break before them. Now there was the image of a gigantic ancient wood, a grave of mysteries and of hauntings whose boughs gave oracles, in whose black depths lurked all the awe and terror of the unknown. Vidis ut faunos lateat in silva, ibi saltat et cantat chorus nympharum eternos. In dreams, too, they had been astonished by the high walls of earth that surged steep about them, by the wizard trees that were of no common growth, by the wild light that poured in a flood upon the valley, by the hushed silence broken by the faint ripple of the tiny stream. Ambrose began in a low voice to utter the great invocation, and as he spoke, something of horror passed away, and peace returned to the valley. It is believed that in this place they told each other all their thoughts and all their love, and made their vows either to other unto life's end. Ambrose spoke of the anguish of the penance that was upon him, that for his sin he must forbear that which he had used so ill, that for them there only remained, if she was willing, the marriage of the cup. And notwithstanding his aversion from the methods of occultism, it is probable, for various reasons, that he has used on this point a certain reticence and reserve, considering apparently that not everything is to be spoken. Hence, it is not easy to say what exactly is intimated by the phrase the marriage of the cup. It is natural, of course, to suppose that some reference is intended to the famous cup of Tylo Sant, which his father had shown him when he was a little boy, and as a matter of fact, there are some notes of a pilgrimage made by Sylvia and himself to Craddock's farm, where they undoubtedly saw the holy vessel. It seems to have been on this occasion that Craddock, now a very old man, told Ambrose of the destiny of the chalice on the failure of the line of hereditary keepers, and the charge was given and accepted, which led to Ambrose's happy and glorious end, and passing out of this life into the pleasures of paradise. Furthermore, it is certain that with the approval of Mr. Vaughan, Sylvia and Ambrose spent a week at Hentis, Craddock's farm, and that after a rigorous fast and the recitation of a solemn and ancient ritual, they watched before the cup for a day and a night. Greater than all my recollection and all my dreams, writes Ambrose, were the glories and splendors of this marvelous and holy work. Again I saw with clearer eyes, with more piercing vision, the endless wanderings and turnings of the spirit in the maze of its journey. Again it seemed impossible that such a magistry could be the work of mortal hands. For a second time my soul was wrapped into the ways of light. I entered that ringing wood of gold and silver and bronze, and heard the perpetual entertainment of the three fairy birds of Rhiannon. I saw the seashore of the savage rocks by the realm of the wastelands, and the foam was driven in torrents on the rocks by a great roaring wind. And then again I saw the white light burst from the walls of the awful sanctuary of Cor Arbenic, where all the hallows and treasures of the island of Britain are preserved. 
I know not how long my spirit dwelt there in the glorious place of the perpetual choir, while there were communicated the words that cannot be uttered, the mystery of mysteries from age unto ages. One body, one spirit, beholds the secret glory. Here, it will be observed, there is no reference to his companion, unless, perhaps, the last sentence may contain some esoteric meaning, which it is not possible to specify further. There is something to be said for this view. One may note, by the way, the grammatical inaccuracy of beholds, where behold is evidently required. But the absence of any explanation of the phrase in Ambrose's notebook must render the whole question a matter of doubt and uncertainty. The tale told afterwards by David Williams, a shepherd on the mountain, must be taken for what it is worth. It is possibly an instance of the faculty of the marvelous, still surviving in an out-of-the-way district. Or, and this is more likely, it is a distorted account of a perfectly natural incident. It must be noted, however, that Williams had a sort of faded reputation as a seer among the inhabitants of the Lonely Mountain Farms, or, in the words of a gentleman connected with the Psychical Research Society, he was highly susceptible to the influence of impressions of a hallucinatory character. It should be premised that the man in question had seen Ambrose and Sylvia walking together once or twice soon after their arrival at Henthus. Ambrose, he said, talked to him for some time on one occasion, and in confirmation of this, it may be mentioned that there is a brief sentence in the notebook about a strange-looking old shepherd with visionary blue-gray eyes. I spoke to him, but he seemed stupid enough. His hands were gnarled and twisted, with rheumatism or gout, I suppose, and looked like the knotted roots of a tree. Williams then asserts that on a certain Sunday morning, he was keeping a sharp lookout after the sheep under his charge. Several of the flock had been missed during the summer, and David Williams had made up his mind that they had been stolen, and that the thief was a man named Lewis, a collier from pont Nowaneth, near Pontypal. Williams had seen, or thought he had seen, Lois, as he called them, prowling about the mountain in a suspicious manner more than once, and he hinted, being well enough pleased with his occult reputation, that he had seen Lois with a sheep over his shoulder in a pewter dish, which served for a magic crystal in his cottage. An interesting case of auto-suggested hallucination, according to the psychical researcher. However, having come to the conclusion that Sunday would be a likely day for the felonious collier's operations, he went into hiding in a break not far from Henthus. Well concealed by the thick undergrowth of hazel and maple, he was able to sweep the mountainside above him, and he could see the track by which the sheep-stealer would probably approach. It was a bright and sunny morning. The sky was deep blue, and here and there little delicate clouds, fleecy white, floated across it. The breeze blew up from the sea, and tossing woods lightened and darkened before it. One could see the waves of the wind, as if it were reflected in the cornfields. And the hills and valleys of Gwent, its rivers and streams, its hanging woods, its white farm walls, were all glittering in the happy peace of the pure sunlight. In his hiding place among the hazel boughs, the shepherd said that the sound of all the bells of all the world came upon him. St. Michael by Torvine, St. Frechva on the hill, were chiming. He heard St. Cadoc ringing in Caramane, and there were faint individual notes of single bells from little churches by the shore. The bells made, he said, music and melody to charm the heart. He kept his eyes intently fixed on the wall of mountain that rose up above him. He could see his sheep feeding by twos and threes in the islands of turf among the tall bracken. It would not be difficult for a man to hide deep in the fern and wait till a sheep grazed within reach, and then to catch hold of the nearest leg and draw the prey into shelter. The wind tossed the bracken to and fro. A brief struggle would not be noticeable, and the thief might crawl off under shelter for a considerable distance. Williams tried to keep one eye on the flock and the other on the path from the north, whence he thought Lois would approach, unless he were already safely hidden under the shaking green fronds, just waiting for his opportunity. A little to the left of his line of vision, 
on the verge between a broken field and the wild mountainside, there was a well shaded by a great thorn tree, which the old people used to call St. Tylo's Well. The water was supposed to be good for the cure of certain sicknesses. It was not more than a hundred yards from Craddock's farm, Hentus. Williams could not quite say what first attracted his attention to the well. He had a feeling, as he said, that a bright light was shining there, as if the sun were glittering on glass. He did not want to look. He was afraid that his attention might be distracted at the crucial moment. There were several sheep grazing quite close to the wall of fern, but he could not keep his eyes fixed. There was all the time that sensation as of a fountain of white light rising from the well. So at last he turned his head, that he might be satisfied that there was nothing to look at. Then he said, something seemed to shoot all over him. His sensations, as he described them, were similar to those of an electric shock. And he saw a figure standing by the well under the thorn tree. Later on, when he told the story a good many times and had been questioned about it, he indulged in an elaborate and detailed account of this figure, the details being, evidently, more or less picturesque afterthoughts. But in his first tale, he confessed that he could not say anything very particular about this shape by the well. He would not, for instance, undertake to swear that it was a man, though he thought it was a man, but not somehow dressed as a man is dressed not nowadays, whatever. The light, if there had been any light at all, had vanished. There was only someone there. And William said that sheep or no sheep, he felt he must go and see who it was. He did not know why, but so it was with him. So he came out of the thicket and began to run towards the well as fast as he could. And then, as his luck would have it, his foot was caught, and he fell full length. It was a minute, perhaps, before he could get up and free himself from the entanglement of the brambles, and it may be that he was a little dazed by the shock of the fall. But to his amazement, the figure that he had seen was no longer by the well under the thorn. Instead, the two young people staying at Hentus were walking towards him. They smiled and nodded as they passed him, standing all astonished and confused, like a man roused suddenly from some strange and bewildering dream. This, and nothing more, was the story told by David Williams before he had introduced the element of imagination. It is not worthwhile detailing the later elaborations of the shepherd's fancy. It is probable, for instance, that his description of what happened when he looked round and saw the figure is but an amplification of the first simple statement as to the shock or shudder that passed through him. As has been said, the original story may be due to the faculty of the marvelous, or it may be a confused account of an ordinary incident. But there seems no reason to suppose that in this early version the shepherd did not at least intend to be veridical, and one or two circumstances in his tale, it is needless to specify them, will not be without interest to responsible and proficient students. It should be said that Ambrose, who of course heard of the story, declined to comment upon it in any sense whatever, and his manner made it impossible to press the question. His notebook contains no reference of any sort to the shepherd's statement. After his brief description of this second visit to the cup of Tylosant, some half-dozen pages are scattered over with odd words and phrases and incomplete tales which no doubt had their meaning and suggestion for the writer, but would be unintelligible to those who do not possess the key. For example, Arian Hreget made a great feast on the day of Pentecost. It was of such splendor and richness being constituted with all the most delicate meats of the earth, and the best wines of Greece and Gascony, and the entire world, being also graced with the art of song, and the presence of the most famous minstrels of the island of Britain, that it was known as the illustrious entertainment of Arian Hreget. Arian sat on high, on a platform thickly strewn with green rushes. His robe was of satin of the color of a red flame. He sat on a cushion of green satin. At the end of the banquet, Morgan the butler served a most precious and aromatic wine from some unknown region of the earth that was called Wine of Pentecost. 
All who drank it praised its color, its flavor, and its odor, and were filled with a great joy. Then there came in a sorry little fellow, and craved speech with Arian. Forthwith it was granted, and he spoke. King Arian, said he, this entertainment is imperfect. Tell me in what respect, said the king, thinking that the man was a jester. With all my heart, said he, it is because you have had no fit drink, and there can be no good feast without good drink, and you have not tasted the only drink that has been provided by the natural world. With that, he drew from under his ragged cloak an old wooden bowl, which he had dipped in the stream as he came on his way to court. In the bowl there was some good water. There were also pebbles, some mud, a few weeds, a snail, and other impurities. This, he said, is the only true drink in the world, for who saw a beast that drank wine? Wine is, in fact, the liquor of dreamers and madmen. Arian and his guests laughed so heartily that the earth shook beneath the hall, and this speech concerning the wine and water is known as one of the three unreasonable sayings of the island of Britain. Again, Tolosine said that a song was still a song, even though the poet had never inscribed it in any characters, and it was declared that the inspiration in the soul of the bard was of greater reality than the trees of the wood. Ogham characters. A bard uttered this sentence. There is dark earth, there is a seed, there is germination, there is a root, there is a stem with leaves, there is a flower with concealed juices, there comes a bee, there is a golden honey, there is distilled mead in foaming horns, there is inspiration and unction in the spirit of the bard. This sentence was confirmed, and it was added that more than once inspiration had been given to poets who were fasting from meat and drink, and thus splendid and magnificent odes had been produced. The remaining notes and jottings are even more fragmentary and inconclusive, and it seems most likely that Ambrose used these remaining leaves as a kind of commonplace book. They may not refer in any way to his life at the Wern or to his relations with Sylvia Vaughan. It is certain that she was very dear to him, dearest of all indeed, and yet it was remarked that when, some five years later, she died very suddenly, she was apparently in perfect health, but was found one morning dead in her bed, he showed no signs of grief or even of shock. Indeed, if it had not been an impossible supposition, those who saw him soon after the news of Sylvia's death would have been inclined to think that he was endeavoring to suppress the signs of a joy and a delight that were almost unendurable in the intensity of their rapture. Strangely enough, certain papers of his seem almost to confirm this supposition, extravagant as it appears to be. They most certainly show no evidence of grief, nor even a passing depression. One sentence from these papers must be quoted here, by reason of the bearing it may have on the matters which have been just recorded. It is taken from a diary kept by Ambrose some three months after Sylvia's death. He was at the Wern, endeavoring to comfort her poor father, who was in the bitterest grief. In this diary, then, he writes under a certain date, We wandered by the old paths, by the places of the old altars, by the well of the fishermen, by the hidden shrines, by the holy streams, by the valleys, and by hills now doubly hallowed by miracles which are past all utterance. We understood, as never before, the miracles of the secrets of the saints, of the secret glory which is hidden from the holy angels. It is difficult to believe that Mr. Vaughan is referred to in this passage. It would be more difficult still for anyone who had known Ambrose Merrick to believe him guilty of any species of occult quackery or mystification. <laughs>